from our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. <laughs> Tonight, I want to turn to John's Gospel, the eighth chapter. The eighth chapter of John's Gospel. And this passage of Scripture, the 32nd verse, the 32nd verse of the eighth chapter of John's Gospel. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. These are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. He, he's having a debate with some of the religious leaders of his day. And he said, ye shall know the truth. Now that word shall could be translated must. You must know the truth if you are to be free. Tonight I want to talk about truth and freedom. We hear a great deal about both today. You know, there's an old Scottish oath upon which our American oath is based, and it reads this way. I pledge before Almighty God, before whom I will give an answer on the day of judgment, to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Jesus said, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now in this passage of Scripture, Jesus discussed two personalities. He discussed God on the one hand, who is truth, and Satan on the other, who is, the, who is a liar and the author of lies. Now, here's what Jesus said. He was pretty rough in some of the things he said. He turned to these religious leaders and he said, You are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in truth because there was no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he's a liar and the father of lies. Jesus said that there's the lie and the truth. And in 2 Thessalonians, the second chapter, we are told that in the latter days of this age, there will be a system called the lie. And a great delusion will sweep over the people of that generation. They will believe a lie. And they will reject the truth. Many people think we're living in that generation. And the Apostle Paul said in the first chapter of Romans that the people of that day had changed the truth of God into a lie. And then secondly, not only do we exchange the truth of God for a lie, but Paul said in Romans, the first chapter and the 18th verse, who hold the truth in unrighteousness. In other words, you can know the truth and not live it. This is holding the truth of God in unrighteousness. The Bible says the wrath of God is against such people. And that's why Christ was so bitter in his denunciation of the hypocrites. You hold the truth intellectually, but you don't live it. Jesus said, you serve me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. You can hold the truth in unrighteousness, and that brings about the wrath of God. And then thirdly, Paul said, judgment according to truth, Romans 2.2. 2. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth. In other words, someday God is going to judge the world. Yes? There's a day of judgment coming. Just as certain as I'm standing here, a day of judgment is coming and God is going to judge us according to the truth. Did we live by the truth? Did we believe the truth? Did we accept the truth? What was our attitude toward the truth? Or did we exchange the truth for a lie? Or did we hold the truth in unrighteousness? God will hold us accountable, the Scripture said. Jesus said, you must know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Now, you know, that's what philosophy has been doing, and that's what science does, and that's what we do in psychology. In every field of study, in every discipline, we're searching for truth. We're trying to find what the laws are. We're trying to find what the truth is. Now, early in childhood, we soon learned the truth that fire is hot. We learned that ice is cold. 
We learned that doing wrong makes us feel guilty and doing good makes us feel good. We learned that early. You see, all of us really are on a quest for truth. What is the truth about myself? Where did I come from? Why in the world did God ever put us on this planet if there's a God? And where are we going? Is there life after death? I'm searching for answers. All of us are, consciously or unconsciously. We ask ourselves these questions. What is truth? The same question Pilate asked 2,000 years ago. And that's why a lot of these kids are taking LSD and mind expansion psychedelic drugs. They're trying to find some experiences that will lead them into some sort of a spiritual truth. Now, truth is important in mathematics, it's important in chemistry, it's important in science, and it's important in the spiritual life. It's important in morality. It's important to find the truth. Jesus said, you shall know the truth. No guesswork, no speculation is allowed. In aviation, you can make one mistake nowadays and may crash into another plane. You must know the truth. Now, Job said, I know my Redeemer lives. The Apostle Paul said, I know in whom I have believed. The Apostle John said, you can know that you're saved. The Bible teaches that you can know the truth. You can find the truth. You can believe the truth. But what is the truth? Every religion and every philosophy may have some of the truth. But there is one place you can find all the truth. Where is it? Jesus said, everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Buddha said, I'm still searching for truth at the end of his life. But Jesus made this astounding claim. Jesus said, I am the truth. Jesus said, I am the truth. I am the embodiment of all truth. And if you're going to get to heaven, you've got to believe that. And you've got to take it by faith. Well, you say anybody that would come along and say, I'm the embodiment of all truth. He must be mentally deranged. He's an egomaniac. Yes, you can, you can make that. You can make a case for that. Or maybe Jesus just told a lie. He knew it wasn't true and he just lied. Yes, that's one of the options. But suppose he is the truth. Suppose he is the embodiment of all truth. And you reject it and exchange the truth for a lie. Then you have made a fatal error for eternity. Now, I personally believe that Jesus is the truth. I believe that he is the embodiment of all truth. I have accepted that by faith, and when I took that step and took that stand, it changed my life. And it's very simple. And he made it so simple that you can know the truth that a blind man, a deaf man, a black man, a yellow man, a red man can come and know the truth. The educated man can know the truth. The uneducated can know the truth. I know people that don't have any education at all, and they know this truth. And it gives them a satisfaction and a joy. And I know professors at the great universities and I know some of the great scientists, they have come and accepted this as the truth and bowed in humility before the Christ back of science. And it's changed their lives. Truth. The profoundest truth in simplicity so that anybody can come and anybody can believe, even children. Whittier once said, we search the world for truth. We call the good and the pure and the beautiful from graven stone and written scroll, from all the plowed fields of the soul and weary seekers of the best. We come back laden from the quest 
to find that all the stage is set in the book our mothers read. It's here. Jesus Christ, the story of Christ, He is the truth. And Jesus said this in that same chapter, in the 24th verse, He said, If ye believe not, listen to this, if you believe not that I am He, you will die in your sins. If you believe not that I am the embodiment of all truth, you're going to die in your sins. You must come and believe and accept and commit. Yes, Christ claimed to be ultimate truth. And Jesus told the truth. He told the truth about sin. Where does the lust and the greed and the pride and the hate and the jealousy and the fighting come from? Why, does, why do people hate each other? Why do they fight and kill and every generation has a war? We've had 55 wars since World War II. Why, why all of this throughout history? The Bible tells us man has a disease of the heart called sin. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts and adulteries and fornications and murders and thefts and covetousness and wickedness and deceit and blasphemy and pride. All of these things come from within and defile a man. We're suffering from only one disease in the world. Our problem is not a race problem, really. Our problem is not a poverty problem. Our problem is not a war problem. Our problem is a heart problem. We need to get the heart changed, the heart transformed. That's why Jesus said, you must be born again. You must have a new nature, a new heart that will be dominated by love. Ah, but we go out and say we ought to love each other. And we, saw, and we soon find that we don't have the capacity to love each other where we're going to get it. We get it from Jesus. You see, the Spirit of God comes into our heart the moment we receive Christ, and He begins to produce in your heart love and joy and peace and patience and temperance. All of these fruits of the Spirit are produced supernaturally by the Holy Spirit when you receive Christ. He told the truth about what is wrong with the world. And then he told the truth about our social responsibility, our responsibility to our fellow man. In the 25th chapter of Matthew, beginning at verse 35, you'll find it. People were hungry. They were sick. They were tired. They were cold. And they were visited in prison. They were visited and they were helped. And at the judgment... Jesus commended them. They said, but Lord, we didn't know that we visited you. We didn't know that we fed you. We didn't know that we did that for you. Jesus said, if you did it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. And every time that you give of your time and your energy and your money to help those in need, you're helping Jesus. You're giving to him. And then he told the truth about judgment. He warned us to flee the wrath of God. Every idle word that men shall speak, they will give an account in the day of judgment, he said. There is a judgment coming. He told the truth about repentance. He said, except you repent, you shall perish. You say, but how do I repent? You say, oh God, I've sinned. I'm willing to change my way of living. I'm willing to live in a new dimension of life. I'm willing to follow you and serve you no matter what the cost. That's repentance. And Jesus said, if you don't repent, you're going to perish. He told the truth about that. He told the truth about conversion. He said, except ye be converted and become as little children, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Be converted. We're frightened of that word in religion. We use it in everything else, but not in religion. Young people want an experience. They want something that means something. They have their happenings and they want to do their thing and they want to take their drug, they want their kicks. And in the church, we've stifled out any kind of religious experience. Jesus said you need to be converted. I can remember the day I was converted. 
I had an experience with God. It wasn't an emotional experience with me. Some people it is. Nothing wrong with emotion. We've got certainly emotional intellectualism today on campus. I see these intellects on campus on television, and boy, they're shouting it up pretty loud for their cause and what they believe. No, we allow emotion for everything except Christ. If anybody sheds a tear on religion, they say too much emotion. And that's one of the devil's lies and the devil's tricks so that we've lost all feeling in our faith and all joy in our faith and all the excitement and the thrill that these early Christians had. Jesus said you need to be converted. Now, the word conversion simply means to change. Turn around. You're going in one direction on the broad road that leads to destruction. Turn around and go in the right direction. Go the narrow road that leads to eternal life. That's what it means, conversion, to change, to turn around. Has that happened to you? Have you changed your way of living? Have you had an experience with Christ? Do you know him personally? Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now I know that there are many people that think they're free already, and they don't know Christ. They think they know how to live. The Bible says there is a way, there's a way, outside of Christ, that seems right unto man. It seems the right thing. But the end is death and judgment. I have a little boy, and when he was much smaller, three years of age, we were loaned a boat down in Florida. And uh, we were going down the river. My friend Lee Fisher was back there trying to get the fishing gear ready, and I was running the boat, and my little boy Ned said, Daddy, I want to run this boat. And I said, no, I don't think you know how to run it. Oh, yes, I know exactly how to do it, he said. And he pushed my hands out of the way, so I let him have the wheels, and he was heading right toward the rocks. You see, we all say, Lord, we know how to run our lives. Don't you interfere. We're, we're going to be all right. We can handle it. Nothing we can't handle. But Jesus warns us that you're heading for the rocks. You're in trouble. Emptiness, neurosis, complexes of various sorts set in, and ultimately the judgment. Repent, be converted while you can. Now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. Now what does the truth do? It sets you free. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. From what? First, it sets you free. Christ sets you free from the penalty of sin. Yes, there's a penalty to sin. Now, we're all sinners. Every one of us is a sinner, and we're all under the penalty of sin, which is death. The wages of sin is death, the Bible says. Now, death carries with it the idea of separation from God in this life and in the life to come. The rich young ruler came to Jesus, and he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He wanted life here and he wanted life to come because he felt the deadness of his spirit and the deadness of his soul. But he wasn't willing to pay the price. There's a price if you come to Christ. The rich young ruler tried to bargain with Jesus. He wanted Jesus to lower the flag. He wanted Jesus to change the rules for him so he could get into the kingdom. But Jesus will never lower the flag. He'll never compromise. He'll never change the rules. You've got to come to Christ just like people did 2,000 years ago if you're ever to get to heaven. We live in sophisticated America. We thought we had all the answers, and look at us. Sending a man to the moon with one hand and building gigantic bombs and rockets with the other to blow the world to pieces. Campuses torn apart. Society being ripped apart. No, we don't have all the answers because, you see, we rejected the truth. We rejected Christ. Receive Christ in your life. Let him come and put the pieces back together in your life. Forgive your sin and give you purpose and meaning to your life and take the penalty of sin away. There is therefore now no judgment to them that are in Christ. He removes the penalty. Secondly, 
He, set you, he can set you free from the power of sin. He said, whosoever committed sin is the servant of sin in this chapter. But when you receive Christ, this power of sin to dominate your life is broken. Sin shall no longer dominate in your life, said Paul to the Romans. Sin shall no longer have dominion over you. You can reckon yourself to be dead to sin so that sin may be in your life. You may commit a sin, but it doesn't dominate you. You don't make sin a practice in your life. You have power over sin, the Spirit of God living in you through a new nature that God gives you. And then thirdly, he sets us free ultimately from the very presence of sin. You read the Revelation, the 21st chapter and the 22nd chapter, and you will see the most glorious description of heaven and the future world. And then it says this. It says, on the outside of this new world, this utopia that is called heaven, that God is building now for those that trust him, for without are the sorcerers, the whoremongers, the murderers, the idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. All liars, all people that live a lie, will be on the outside, he said, excluded and banished from the presence of God. Jesus said, I am the truth. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. There was an ad in the New York Times today, a whole page that said, come to life. Great big boxcar letters, come to life. I'm asking you tonight to come to life. Come to the truth, to the source of life, to Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Someday we'll be removed from the very presence of sin and the devil and all lies. We shall overcome someday. Till then, we can have God's life right here on this earth. We can have a little bit of heaven. We can be set free from the bondage of sin and slavery and the devil right now. Christ can set you free. I'm asking you tonight by faith to receive him. To receive the truth. Notice I said by faith. You cannot come with your mind alone because your mind was affected by sin. You have to come like a little child, except you become his children and be converted, said Jesus. You have to come like a little child by simple childlike faith and receiving. And if you will, he comes into your heart, gives you a new nature, and you can go out and live a new life. Now, it's hard and it's tough and it's rough to follow Christ. I don't want you to come under any false illusion. But when you make that commitment, you don't go back into the world and back to your house and back to your neighborhood to live the Christian life alone. He goes with you. I'm going to ask you to come tonight and receive him openly and publicly. Every person that he called in the New Testament, he called publicly. There was a reason for it. He said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father, which is in heaven. Come publicly. I'm going to ask you from all over the stadium to get up out of your seat, hundreds of you, and come and stand in front of this platform quietly and reverently and say tonight, I want to receive Christ. I want the truth. I want the truth to dominate my life. But you get up and come right now from all over, men, women, young people. God has spoken to you tonight. You need Christ. You come. We're going to wait. As hundreds are responding to Mr. Graham's invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ, you can make that same commitment right where you are. Just pick up the phone and call the number you see on your screen. Special friends are waiting to talk with you and pray with you about this most important decision.
I do not know whether you can see this great scene here at the Garden in New York or not, but hundreds of people are coming from all over this great amphitheater to receive Christ as the way and the truth and the life in their hearts. You can make that same commitment right now in your home where you are watching by television. God help you to make that commitment tonight. If you just prayed that prayer with my father or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I will just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now tonight I want you to turn with me to 1 John, the fifth chapter. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may know that ye have eternal life and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. I want to speak about knowing, being absolutely sure that you know Christ because it was written to give you assurance that your sins are forgiven and that you're going to heaven. The Gospel of John, though, was written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. In other words, the Gospel of John was written to bring you to Christ and the little Johns were written to help you to know how to live the Christian life and to be sure that you do know Christ. There's so many people that go to church and so many people that have been baptized and so many people that have been confirmed in the church, but they don't have the assurance. They don't have the certainty. They don't know for sure that Christ lives in their heart. So 1 John was written that you might know that you have eternal life. In 1 John 3, 23 it says, and this is his commandment that we should believe on the name of the Son of God. Do you believe? Well, you say, yes, I believe. Do you really? Do you know what believe means in the Bible? What, it, what faith is in the Bible? It means that you put your total weight on Christ. It's the story that I told the other night. I'll tell it again about this fellow that came over from France and he announced that he was going to put a tightrope across Niagara River at Niagara Falls and he was going to walk across it. Well, a big crowd of people gathered on both sides of the river, the Canadian side and the American side, and they watched. And sure enough, he walked over and he walked back and they applauded. He did it two or three times and then he took a wheelbarrow and he put 200 pounds of dirt in it and rolled it over and rolled it back and rolled it over and rolled it back. Then he asked, how many of you believe I can roll a man across? And they said, oh, we know you can do it. And so there was one man in the front row that was quite enthusiastic about it. And he said, sir, he said, would you mind stepping in the wheelbarrow and being the first man? Well, that man was gone. I don't blame him. But you see, that's what faith is. You put your total weight in the wheelbarrow. You put your total weight on Christ. And Christ is the one that you're to put your faith in. Whosoever believeth that Christ is, whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for and a conviction of things not seen. Real faith carries with it the idea of commitment. Not just believing with your head, but a commitment of your life, of every phase of your life to Christ, your vocation, your studies, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, 
your sex life, everything is committed to Christ. The first question is, do you really believe, have you really committed your life to Christ all the way? Get that settled. Then the second question in this examination, a changed attitude toward sin. 1 John 1, 8 and 10 says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Yes, as Christians, sometimes we sin. We may sin without knowing it because there are sins of omission, sins of commission, somebody you should have helped, somebody you should have smiled to today that it would have encouraged them and you didn't do it. But he says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you do sin, there's a remedy. God will forgive you if you confess it. And the Bible says the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. The blood that was shed on the cross when Christ died has the power 2,000 years later to wash all your sins away. I thank God that he stayed on that cross and when they put those nails in his hands and the spike through his feet and the spear in his side, he stayed there. He didn't come down. He stayed on the cross because he loved you. He loves you tonight. Whoever you are, whatever you've done, however bad you've been, he loves you. And when he uses... Now, after you have come to Christ, what should be your attitude towards sin? First, if you do commit a sin, confess it immediately. Secondly, forsake it immediately with his help. Thirdly, seek after righteousness and holiness. Be sure that you don't do that again. You know, some people will commit a sin and then they come to God and ask for forgiveness and then they'll go and commit the same sin, commit it over and over and over again. It means you turn from sin. You don't go back and do that again. In the 23rd Psalm, David said, he restores my soul. Do you need your soul restored tonight? There are hundreds of people here tonight that are believers, but you need to rededicate your life. You need a new surrender. There are people here tonight that God is calling to be a missionary. There are people here tonight that God is calling to work in the church. There are people here tonight that God is asking to speak to people where they live and where they work, to speak to them about Christ. And that's mission work. If you're a member of the body of Christ and have rebelled, you can confess it and you can receive forgiveness and full restoration and he restores your soul. That's a wonderful thing. And then the third question is this. Do you have a desire to obey God? 1 John 2, 3 says, And hereby we know that we, have, that we know him if we keep his commandments. Go through the New Testament and mark up every place where it says you should do this or you should live this way and find where you failed. An infallible sign of the new birth is that we, may, we want to obey Christ. I don't obey Christ because I'm afraid not to obey Him. I obey Him because I want to. I love Christ. I want to obey His will. I want to do the things He wants me to do. Like a daily devotional life. It's hard to have a daily devotional life because the devil fights you so. If you open the Bible and start reading, the devil will make you sleepy. Or somebody will come in immediately and uh, want to talk to you. Or maybe there's a good TV program on and the temptation is to turn that TV program on. And you don't have time to pray and you don't have time to read the Bible. Then fourthly, there's the separation from the world in 1 John 2. I love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. 
If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him, for all, that all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And if you love the world more than you do Christ, you're not in the kingdom of God. And how many of us tonight love the world? The devil is called the God of this world. He's called the prince and power of the air. He has tremendous power. There are many demons in the world. And those demons are working with the devil to destroy your Christian life. The moment you receive Christ, the devil is going to be after you. He's going to tempt you. He'll bring things to you that you never dreamed you'd be tempted to do. Temptation is not of God. Temptation comes from the devil. And how do you fight the devil? He tempted Jesus. He caught Jesus at a time when Jesus had not eaten or had anything to drink for 40 days and 40 nights in a wilderness. And he tempted Jesus three times, and they were real temptations. And how did Jesus combat him? He didn't argue. He didn't debate. He didn't use his supernatural power. He just quoted scripture. Every time Satan came with his temptation, Jesus quoted a passage from the Old Testament, a scripture verse. And that's the reason it's very important to memorize all the scripture you can. I've reached the age where it's hard to memorize scripture. I wish I'd memorized 10,000 times more than I did when I was young. While you're young, while you're in school and after you leave school, those early years, you can retain scripture. You see, you, you take a scripture verse and memorize it, and that'll stay with you all your life if you, if you repeat it week after week and week after week. It's yours for life. And when the devil comes with his temptation, you're there with the sword because the scripture is called the sword of the spirit. And that's your, battle, that, that's your armor that you use to fight Satan when he comes. Are you separated from the world? The scripture says, and the world passes away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God shall abide forever. And you know, when, when I face some situation, shall I watch this TV program? Shall I go to this film? Shall I do this particular thing that's in the world? And there's a doubt in my mind as to whether I should do it or not do it. There are certain questions one can ask yourself. First, I ask myself, does it violate any principle of Scripture? The thing I'm thinking about doing, does it violate any principle of Scripture? Secondly, does it take the keen edge off my Christian life? I'm not keen for God after seeing that as I was before I saw it. Thirdly, can I ask God's blessing on? And then I ask myself the fourth question, is it a stumbling block to others? If someone else who was a believer saw me doing this thing, saying that thing, losing my temper, whatever, is that going to be a stumbling block to them? And then the fifth question I ask myself is, do I love of the Christians of all denominations? Do I love other people? Do I love the poor enough to do something about helping them in their poverty? Do I love the people in my own neighborhood who have a different color skin? Do I really love them? Or do I just put it on? Is this just an act that I put on? Is it a real love affair with people no matter what their background may be. The scripture says we know that we've been passed from death to life because we love. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Many children of God who do not walk with Christ think that 
other things are more attractive than walking with Christ and asking ourselves such questions as this. How can we live in the present society and be separated from the world that is run by the devil? How can we? Only with the help of Christ. And then sixthly, if you really know Christ, you do not practice sin. 1 John 5, 18, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. The devil can't touch him. You say, but it says sins not. That word actually means doesn't practice sin. You may make a mistake and you may yield for a moment and you may fall one time or two times or ten times or twenty times or whatever it may be. But you won't practice sin. You won't do it over and over and over and over again. You'll confess it and forsake it and give it up and say, Lord, help me. I'm so weak. I need your help to live a Christian life. And then seventhly, there's the witness of the Spirit. If you really know Christ, you will know it because there'll be a witness of the Spirit in your heart. The Spirit himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. How do I know? Not only the Word of God tells me, not only my life tells me that I know God, but it's like the little boy that was flying his kite and the kite had gotten out of sight like these low clouds that we're here today and uh, the top of the towers the television towers you could you couldn't see the very top because the clouds were so low and this boy's kite had disappeared it had gotten so high but he was holding on he couldn't see it and somebody said, what are you doing? He said, I'm flying a kite. They said, we don't see a kite. How do you know it's up there? Oh, he said, I feel the tug of it. And when you come to know Christ, you feel the tug of Christ in your heart. And you know that he lives in your heart. Do you feel that tug in your heart? Do you? Do you? If you're not absolutely sure that Christ lives in your heart and you're totally committed to him, you can make this the moment in which a great transformation takes place in your life. No, and you will have a power that you don't have. You see, we're talking about yielding totally, not to yourself and not to your friends, not to the material things, but yielding to Christ. A yielded mind makes an intelligent Christian. Now secondly, a yielded sex life makes a dynamic Christian. Yes, there's nothing wrong with sex. God gave it to us. It's one of his great gifts to us. It's for our enjoyment. It's for to keep the race going. And we're to enjoy sex, but within the bonds of matrimony. Sex is for human reproduction and the fulfillment of married love. All those other functions we're trying to use sex for are merely unsolved spiritual problems which only Christ can solve. And then a yielded body makes a useful Christian. In Romans 6, it says, Likewise, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. Don't let sin control you, that you should obey it and the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead 
and your members as instruments of righteousness. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice acceptable unto God. Our bodies belong to God. Our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, a yielded heart makes a devoted Christian. The American Heart indi Association indicates that 27 Americans are afflicted with heart disease. But we also have the, disease, the spiritual disease of the heart. The Bible talks about in Proverbs 12, the deceit that's in the heart. Proverbs 14, man is a backslider in heart. Proverbs 18, the heart of man is haughty. Proverbs 22, sin is bound up in the heart. Man's real heart problem is spiritual. That's the reason you need to come to the cross to find forgiveness, to find a new life. And he says he'll give you a new heart and turn you completely around. And then lastly, a yielded will makes a forceful and a determined Christian. A yielded will. You see, there are three little men that live inside of all of us. There's the mind, there's the emotion, and there's the will. The scripture says, whosoever will, let him come. It doesn't say whosoever achieves or whoever understands or whosoever deserves it, or, but it says whosoever will. The door to the kingdom of God is open to every person here tonight to live a victorious life, to live a glorious life in which you know your destiny and you know your purpose and meaning. I read about some years ago, they had a great meeting in England of uh, factory workers, and Dwight L. Moody was speaking to them, and he closed by saying, I'm offering you Jesus Christ, Christ who died on the cross and who rose again for you. I'm offering you Christ, and I want you to stand up and say, I will or I won't. I will receive him. I won't receive him. And the man stood hesitatingly up and he said, I will. Another one said, I won't. Another one said, I will. Another one said, I won't. Another one said, I will. Another one said, I won't. And the audience was divided. About half said, I will follow Christ. I will serve him. I will surrender to him. But another half said, I won't. Which would you be? Which, which group would you be in? Because you see, when your will responds, it can also say, I won't. Which are you going to say tonight? I'm going to ask you to say tonight, I will. I will, to the best of my knowledge, receive Christ into my heart, and I want to live the kind of life you've been talking about. I don't have the strength, I don't have the energy, I don't have, I just feel that I can't do it. But I'm willing to start. And I'm willing to say tonight, I will with God's help yield my life to Christ as Savior and Lord and Master. And he may speak to you about serving him in some other part of the world. My oldest son, just Franklin, just came back from Sudan. He said he saw suffering on a scale that he had never seen anywhere in his travels in the world. What God could do with some of you people in places like that. What are you going to say tonight? I will or I won't? I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat. All of you that will say, I will. I want you to get up out of your seat and come and stand here in front as we've seen every night and say tonight I will open my heart to Christ. I will receive him. I will surrender to him. I want to know that I'm going to heaven. I want to know that I'm living for Christ. I want to serve him.
If you're with friends or relatives, they'll wait on you. Why do I ask you to come forward publicly like this? Because Jesus said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father, which is in heaven. There's something about coming forward and standing publicly that pleases Christ and helps you to mean it. If you're in the choir, you come. If you're a Sunday school teacher or if you're even a pastor of a church and you're not sure how you stand before God, you get up and come. We're going to wait on you. As hundreds here in the arena are responding to Mr. Graham's invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ, you can make that same commitment right where you are. Just pick up the phone and call the number you see on your screen. Special friends are waiting to talk with you and pray with you about this most